This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Ed Secota. Ed is affectionately titled by me, a living legend. And even if no one else knew who Ed was, I would call him that. Not from any kind of a hero worship standpoint or anything like that. But early on in my career, Ed influenced me. He got me thinking clearly. If you ever see me picking apart arguments, starting debates, and perhaps you fixate on the emotional component of the debate, and you don't look at the facts, and you don't look at the logic, that's what I learned from Ed. Put aside the emotion. Let people get all hot and bothered. Let them get all worked up. And then calmly, coolly, break everything into its component parts and try and move things along a process that gets to a good answer. Maybe there's not a perfect answer, but let's move things along to a good answer. Let's think clearly about our words and our actions. I'm forever grateful that Ed Sakota influenced me in that fashion. I hope you enjoy this conversation. You know, I was trying to think of an example just as we were getting on the, the call here. And I was thinking, and I'm not trying to, to pick on a particular bank or anything necessarily, but I, a, a few years ago, I read something that uh, J.P. Morgan had made money every day in the first quarter of the year. And I was thinking, wow, that's just... Is that a great example of the Gavopoli system in, in action? Would be one question to you. The second part of that question, though, would be, is that if there doesn't seem to be much outrage right now, and I'm wondering if, if the outrage, the lack of outrage, is reflected in the fact that so many average, everyday people via mutual funds and perhaps pensions actually have investments in these many Gavopoli-type companies. It just seems like it's a precarious situation. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't want to comment on any uh, particular banks, and I'm not sure exactly in what uh, section you're talking about. But it's uh, everywhere you look. Everywhere there's a regulation, and there's a, a gavopoli system at work. And the outrage, uh, as you say, the outrage doesn't really occur because this, as the system grows, more and more people have an investment in it. And as as you stop competition within a, within a um, economy, the whole economy itself becomes less competitive. And we're certainly seeing that show up in our relationships with other uh, countries, where particularly China and, and other um, uh, countries, India and so forth. We're not competitive. The whole economy, our, our economy is not competitive because we don't, we don't allow ourselves to compete with one another anymore. And so we're not competitive with, with, with other countries. I, I think to add, to add to that point on the other countries, I see it being in Asia right now. It seems like that in Asia, you can build an 80-story office tower uh, faster than sometimes perhaps you can install a fence in America. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, trying to, trying to do anything uh, um, uh, in the United States requires enormous amount of regulatory effort. And uh, the, uh, companies have to maintain whole staffs just just to uh, comply with regulations. And all of that has got to get pay, paid for somewhere. So they've got to eventually get to raise prices and we're not competitive. So it's uh, and, and I'm not I'm also I'm not saying any of this is bad or wrong or should be changed. I'm, in my book, I don't say that there's anything wrong. I'm just looking at how does the engine work? How does this work and how do we explain what we've got? And I'm not trying to change anything. I'm just saying, well, this is, this is how it works, and I need to know how it works because, you know, as, as your audience does, and, and so do I, we, we try to trade, and we want to understand as, as best we can what's going on. 
So my point is not my, my point is not to change anything. I'm not I'm not a politician, and I'm not uh, running for office or anything. I'm I'm not promising any changes, or I don't have any formula for change. I'm saying this is what's happening, and you might as well take this into your personal calculus when you're when you're uh, playing the markets. Well, you make a good you make a great point because uh, you're talking to a guy that unfortunately grew up in the Washington D.C. area, so I had to listen to too much politics, and I think. If I think there's a, there's a great video on the internet with Ray Dalio talking about the economic machine, and I think you're doing something similar, but it's your take, your research, and you're saying, hey, look, this is the machine that I see. This is the the economy as I see it, and I'm not trying to give you a value judgment on it, but by all known facts and my research, the evidence lays out, this is what's happening. Yeah, and uh, Dalio, has, Dalio has a wonderful video out there, and he's talking about how the economy works. Basically, his analysis, the uh, supposition he has, we have a free economy, and those kinds of things work in a free economy. But since 1913, when we had the Fed, you'll, you'll see uh, the free economy isn't really uh, free to function anymore. And if you look at you look at long-term charts up till 1913, before 1913, when we had the Fed, we had a fairly stable economy. We had blips, ups and downs, and and uh, and so forth. But since since the Fed's come along, it's enabled it's enabled the uh, Gavapoli system to put an effective tax rate on uh, citizens and spend money in excess of what they can tax. There used to be a limit to government uh, growth and the Govopoli system. That limit was that they would have to tax people in order to fund the, uh, fund the government. But they don't have to do that anymore. They can, they can go to the Fed and they can get a, however the mechanism works, however you want to explain the mechanism. Uh, they can either, you can say they can print up money or get a line of credit or whatever. Basically, they can spend money before they tax. I've shown in my model if you keep if you keep government spending to under about a percent and a half asset effective asset tax so under a percent and a half government never can grow big enough to stop the uh, the growth of the free competition sector. But once once you once you get a um, an effective tax rate above that, then the government will grow and it will it's like it's a parasite it's the same mathematics of a, of a parasite where the parasite will grow and then it finally will take over the host or like a cancer a cancer or a parasite the mathematics and the dynamics are the same it stays in balance if you keep the asset tax rate under about a percent and a half but we're way over that now and we are seeing a decline in manufacturing and tool making and you're seeing we're consuming, or the uh, the Gavapoli system is now consuming the free competition sector. And when we run out of a free competition sector, which is imminent in my opinion, then we have a whole different we have a whole different economy where you have the Gavapoli system trying to manage uh, the free competition sector, and it can't do that. It doesn't know how to do that. It's not set up to do that. It's set up to take and exploit. It's not set up to create and innovate. And so we're, we're, we're headed towards a, an economy in which we have basically a controlled economy, less freedom. I'm, I'm not suggesting this is going to change. I'm suggesting you've got you've to start admitting that's what's happening and you've got to cope with it. You have to cope with it in, in your decision making. And there are ways to cope with it. Wishing it'll come back and thinking you can vote for somebody that's going to turn around, I think, is uh, wishful thinking. Let me, let me take a step back, Ed. I want to kind of take a step back for a second, let you talk a little bit about some historical perspectives, your own in particular. And one of the things that I've always loved about you, and we're going to get back on the Gavapoli conversation and, and kind of take it to its natural ending and, and some of the solutions that you see since we're, if we're being faced with this Gavapoli situation, you do see some clear uh, solutions or at least some, some uh, directions that people can go. There's no perfection for sure. But I think one well, of the things I don't think there's, a, I don't think there's a, I don't, I don't think there's a solution for the economy i don't think there's a problem it's just this is just what it does i think there are some things that people can do as individuals to cope with it as it evolves and changes but i'm certainly not suggesting a change in in the economy i think this is just what it does there's nothing to fix this is what it does just like people you know they get born they grow they mature and then they die that's the way it happens and so you just have to learn to cope with things well you know you just you just made my point for where i wanted to go which is 
and correcting me on language, one of the things that I've always learned from you and admired from you is the clear thinking. And 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 I always, when I try to respond to people, if I'm doing an interview or something in an online forum, I try to stay clear. I try to be as objective as I can. You are you are exceptionally good at this, and especially when when, when people look at your writings, they can see for sh- you know, it's very very clear. How did you start to have this type of clear thinking as an individual? Or was this something that you felt always as a young man and it's been with you your whole life? How did you develop this 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 way to look at the world clearly? Well, thank you. I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a struggle for me. I'm, I'm thinking about it a lot. And I, I always think, wow, I could have said that. I could have said that better. I'll probably hear this interview and I'll say, oh, man, that's... <laughs> That's pretty. That's pretty lame. I, I I do a lot of rewriting, writing and rewriting, and I've always done that. And I I try to think about something until it gets simple. And if it's complicated, I figure I don't understand it yet. So one of the things I do is I just think about things till it gets simple, and then they're easy to explain, and then they're pretty clear. And I've had some uh, I've had some mentors in my life that have been sticklers. Uh, Jay Forrester, for one, uh, absolutely unforgiving about any misuse of English or any any anything any equations. They ought to be annotated, and the units of measure had to match, and you just couldn't get away with anything. And so I've I developed that. Uh, I just developed that habit. I've developed this to such an extent that uh, I mean, have a, a language that goes with it: S V O P, which subject verb object. Keep it in the present tense. That's a way that helps sort it out. If I find myself straying from that grammatical uh, convention, I figure I don't understand something. You know, anything that's clear fits into that um, into that linguistic format. So I'm on this, and I, I enjoy it. It's just a, I probably take it to extreme. It's not. <laughs> it's it's not a good strategy socially. <laughs> um, it's so, socially, people are very metaphoric and they're very inaccurate and they just say what they feel and you've got to decipher their feelings and, and so forth. So I don't recommend this as a social, as a social uh, method, but as far as uh, thinking and trying to get logical answers, it's pretty good. You know, I was wondering maybe if you would go a little bit further on Jay Forrester. And for those that don't know, uh, very well-known uh, MIT professor, uh, systems dynamics. And uh, and I think Jay is still with us. He's like 96, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I, prior to uh, publishing my book, I went and visited with him and, um, and I included him, uh, some things on him in the book. Uh, amazing person. He uh, at one point held the... Uh, a patent on the um, core memory uh, for computers, enabling some of the first of the world in computer. Uh, he was behind that. Uh, he was inventor of the uh, radar positioning system, which was a, a servo control mechanism. And then he went on and uh, applied servo thinking, a servo, a servo control thinking to business situations and developed a modeling language invented the whole field of uh, system dynamics to really understand to really understand how systems work um, I think requires a lot of training it, it's, I think it's imperative to have some kind of an engineering background preferably electrical engineering preferably a servo dynamics um, to understand how systems work so there's a whole field and it's and he pioneered it and he's just this is an amazing guy you know, I was I was actually I'm working on a project right now, and I was reading a couple of his white papers recently, and it's uh, I I can see how he influenced you on the the clear thinking because his white papers are just crystal clear. There's it's it's just it, you actually it's it's fun to read them because it's just very there's no beating around the bush. It's all just direct. There's no and it's it's understandable too. It's not uh, an academic treatise. It's something that you can sit down and start to digest. He would go to conferences on on economics, and there would be a panel, and and then they would have comments, and he would point out that this, a certain speaker in his speech had contradicted himself several times. <laughs> and he would he would listen. He would really listen to what people say, and he would think about it, and then if it wasn't accurate, he wasn't shy about about saying so. No, like I said, I, I think for the audience out there not familiar, 
checking out your Trading Tribe website at edstakota.com, they could definitely get a uh, an understanding of, if they're not familiar with what you and I are talking about right now, they will definitely uh, start to understand how you handle your FAQs, your frequently asked questions. But that's a completely different subject. Let me... Let move, me, uh, let me go ahead. On, on, the, on, the, uh, on the topic of getting things exactly right, I want to point out that's sakota.com, not edsakota.com, S-E-Y-K-O-T-A.com. Ed Sakota <laughs> goes somewhere else. Yeah, and so do I, but the website is com. <laughs> Ed, let me get back into the notion of Gavopoli for a second. So we've got this system that's 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 operating, and as you kind of say, it's it's doing as it should. You are observing and you're describing it, but it's not a it's not a pretty conclusion to win the the 39th day and uh, the duckweed uh, races across the pond. It's not a pretty conclusion. I think what's what's tough when you look at the media and the political systems, everybody has a fix. If you vote for me, I can fix it. I, I've got this platform. Uh, the media says if we do this, we can fix it. If we watch this TV show, if we get if we get upset about this issue, and I'm just as guilty as some people to get upset about things, but it's it's all seems to be one big dog and pony show. But if we get back to your modeling of the of the Gavopoli system. The dog and pony show just distracts us, but the system marches on. Well, the, the dog and pony show is part of the system. Uh, the dog and pony show is purposely orchestrated to distract people from the real issues. Nobody talks about the, the real engine behind this is the growth of the Gavopoli system and its, and the fact that it has unlimited access to money. In my model, I've even tried to, even if you eliminate borrowing for the government and you and you reduce regulations at this point it would take 20 or 30 years of austerity to get any meaningful change to get us back to a free competition society you're not going to get you're not going to get anybody elected on a 30 year austerity program in which they the government decides that they're not going to borrow money anymore and that's just going to happen so uh, nobody's even talking about this or nobody's even interested in it. The real issues, the real issue about how the economy works and how debt works and how um, deficit spending works and bailouts and all the rest of that, uh, those are just kind of accepted and no one concern, is concerned about it. What they're concerned about is, is there's a race riot or there's uh, police or uh, – Someone thinks the police are being, being too brutal, or one 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 race group is beating up on another race group, or there's people coming across the border or not coming across the border. So we're we're talking about fixing things that are all symptoms, but nobody. Uh, there, well, there's a couple. There's a couple politicians. Uh, I don't care to name any of them, but there's a couple of them that, 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 that try to talk about the real issues. They always get marginalized, and they don't even make the the final cut off the final cut in the political race. And what you have is the, the distinction between political parties is is fairly obscure at this point. They're all voting for expansion of the Gavopoli system. They want to make this the system is now is now in its final phases where it's taking over. There's no way to resist it. There's no way to stop it. I don't recommend spending a lot of time worrying about it. It's like a, a patient or if, if you had a friend that was dying of uh, you know, terminal cancer, well, what do you do? You try to make the best of the time you have, but you don't um, spend a lot of time trying to trying to fix it there's nothing to fix or someone is just dying there's no there's nothing to fix we're making a transition or a butter you know your caterpillar better a caterpillar turns into a butterfly and is a change in form there's nothing to fix it's how it works and you know you don't have to use death metaphors just a transformation metaphor the economy is transforming from uh what used to be a free competition innovative society it's now transforming into a very controlled society this is a transition it's natural it happens time and time again to all societies it goes there's a cycle it goes back and forth and there's a uh, the the Gavopoli system grows until it finally renders the renders the host society 
inoperable, and then then it collapses, and then there's then it starts over again. This is a long term cycle. You don't find any you don't find any currencies around that are more than a couple hundred years old. And if you had if you had invested if you had invested a penny a penny one penny at the at the uh, at the birth of uh, Christ at uh, year zero or whatever year you want to make the difference between BC and AD back then that one penny growing at nominal interest rates of a couple percent would be more than all the money in the world so you say well how can that be because there certainly was a penny and there certainly was ways to invest and how come nobody has done that well because you you earn a lot of money and then you get a, you get these periodic resets in the in the money so nobody's able to accumulate money for very long because the money the money eventually goes worthless <laughs> and that's also part of the design and you you have hard money uh, for a while you have gold or sticks or some other tokens of of exchange cattle or whatever you have and then you go off into uh, uh, currency and then you get uh, bankers decide they can lo loan out money because not everybody's going to come and get the money at the same time, and then you get fractional reserve banking, and then you get a federal or a, uh, a central bank, and then you get excesses, and you get huge bubbles, like having having um, bubbles, bubble much more frequent and much larger bubbles now, and eventually the bubbles are just going to uh, uh, the bubbles are just going to dominate, and, and and every bubble becomes more severe than the last one. You know, and I think for some people listening, I could see some in the audience already building up a criticism in their mind. And I think what people need to understand is that you're not, you know, so, some people might be thinking, oh, sh Ed, Ed Sakota, he sounds bearish or he sounds like a, a doom and gloomer. Whereas it, it's, a, it's a very, you are taking a very distinct perspective to where like, look, I'm observing the system as it is. I'm not, you're very clear about it. You're saying, don't, you can't really worry about it. You can't stop it. And I think, and you're not trying to make a, a, a prediction of the timing of something. You're just objectively trying to analyze the economy that we all are in the middle of. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying anything wrong with it. I think this is the way it works. You just, and that, that's basically what we do in the trading tribe is we look at, you know, how, how can we be more effective as people in coping with the environment? If you'd been around a hundred years ago, or maybe in you know, back in the in the early 1800s, a whole different economy. You want to get out there and build machines, start factories, and and hire people, and and participate in the greatest economic miracle of the, ever. These days, it's different. It's a just it's a different. And there, there certainly are pockets, pockets of innovation. There are very bright people coming up with whole new industries. And you got you drones flying around that we didn't have before, and lots of lots of advances. So there certainly are people innovating, but by and large, a lot of people are out of work, and you have a huge dependent class, and you have huge amount of moral hazard in the economic system, and you have um, a disconnect between uh, our governance. And uh, and people, people don't even, don't even believe what the politicians are telling them anymore. So you've got you have a whole different you have a whole different economy and a whole different society, and it's just part of the evolution. And uh, there are there are, you can find all kinds of books about what we ought to do to fix things. I don't think there's anything to fix. I think it's just how it works. And there's and and there's always people that think we should fix things. It's one of the symptoms of this transition we're going through. Is there's people who want to you know, go out there in the fall and pick up the leaves and glue them back on the trees because they liked it better in the spring when it, when the, when the leaves were green and on the trees. But, but you can't you can't glue that you can't glue the, the leaves back on the trees. You just have to accept the fall for the beauty that's there and 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 move with it. So that's what we do in the trading tribe is we try to you know how, what can we do with our own with our own attitudes and our own responses to cope with whatever whatever the flow is. Not try to not try to change things. Pretend they're different. What can we do to um, to go with the flow? In other words, to use trend following in our own personal lives. I know you look at trend following from not only from a trading perspective, but your own life perspective. Yeah, and I think if you're going to really be a trend follower, you're going to have a lot of trouble 
uh, limiting it to one area because you, you know, let's say you have a trend following system. You say, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have a diversified portfolio, um, a trend following portfolio. So I'm going to free myself up from emotions. Emotions have always been the big problem here. So I'm going to have a diversified trend following portfolio, or I'm going to invest in somebody else's uh, portfolio, and that's going to fix this emotional problem. And then what happens? Well, their, their investment or their portfolio goes up and down. And then I've got emotional problems with that. So you don't, you don't really fix your emotions by having a system. What you do is you just move them upstream. You move them upstream instead of you have constituents within the portfolio that used to bother you and they went up and down. And then now you have a portfolio that goes up and down. You just move the problem upstream. Stream. So ultimately, you have to say, well, what what is it that I'm feeling, and and what do I do when I feel these things, and can I come up with better and more a useful or productive ways of responding when the thing goes up and down? And eventually, you've got to you've got to come to terms with that. And so, the, the best trend followers, I think, are the ones that have made peace with themselves and have said, well, his, this is what I do in the case of things going up and down. Uh, the value increasing and decreasing. Um, this is how I behave, and this, this is how I um, act. And of course, as you know, there are all kinds of things you can do when things go up. Some people, when something goes up, they sell them. Some people, when things go up, they buy. And when they keep going up, some people sell more, and some people buy more. And, and if you if you go to extreme in either of those cases, you 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 you're you're counterproductive, you're self-destructive. You've got to know how to do that, and you've got to do it consistently. You've got to do it in your personal life. I think if you do these things in your personal life as well, it supports a trend following. Because if you're, if you're not in alignment between your overall philosophy and how you behave as a person, and you try to, you try to do trend following, well, there's going to be conflicts. And so we, we in, in Tribe, in Trading Tribe, we hardly ever talk about uh, actual trading or what the markets are doing what we're doing what we're working with is the uh, emotional reaction to volatility or emotional reaction to loss or to structure or authority or all these other issues people straighten these things out their relationships with their significant others and their children get better they report more satisfaction in all areas of life and oh incidentally their trading is getting better and they don't quite know how that happened but it's just they've turned into a person that now can cope with can cope with um, uncertainty and can cope with volatility and they couldn't do it before and you can't in my opinion you can't take a system and use that to medicate your feelings you've got to deal with you've got to get your feelings uh, and uh, some people say well I'm just gonna I'm just suppress my feelings a stiff upper lip approach or grin and bear it or clench your teeth and hope for the best um i tend to go the other way you try to say what's the positive intention of these feelings celebrate them find out the positive intention and as soon as you do that the feeling disappears and you go on to the next feeling so i'm more of the go with the flow on the feelings as well so there's a lot of different approaches but by now, after we've been doing this a couple decades, we're developing a body of knowledge of how to do this. And, and, and to what extent can we actually reprogram response patterns? We're, we're getting pretty good at this. As we, we've got, and, and, you know, you can follow what we're doing. I, I put it all on the, on the blog at uh, Trading Tribe, uh, tradingtribe.com. Uh, all this is free if people want to go on there and look at it. And we're documenting we're documenting the growth of all kinds of people are using this technology and it seems to be um, to the extent they use it it seems to be working pretty well for them it always just seems like to me that the the place that one is trying to find is just some some peace and contentment and and this 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 just again i start off with giving you the praise of the clear thinking i think that's the to just be able to sit in a room and not feel I mean, you're, you're not not to have this anxiety and worrying constantly, and if, and if one has that, to work on that. And and I think it's just trying to find it. I see a lot of parallels to your work and some of the meditation. Uh, I read some of the, the Zen scholars like Alan Watts. It seems like there's some commonalities with some of your work in the Eastern thought process. 
I believe every feeling has a positive intention. For instance, if you're in a house and you smell smoke, uh, you hear crackling sounds and notice the, the temperature going up in the room and you conclude that maybe the house is on fire, that would be a really good time to feel anxiety and to take some action in response to it. So I'm not so sure that you want to you know, medicate your mind, uh, anesthetize yourself and put yourself into some... Um, uh, some meditative state where you don't respond that's not that's not really what i'm saying i think you want you want to f you want to notice the feeling you're having in the moment and act appropriately and you want to learn the difference between medicating a feeling and responding to it proactively so it's not always i'm not suggesting you always aim towards peacefulness sometimes you want to get busy you might want to get busy and put a trade on or you might want to get busy and uh take some corrective action some risk control, or you might want to take some action and get into some opportunity. But whatever it is, I think you can learn to come into harmony with your feelings. And to some extent, it's nice to just be able to be peaceful and watch your feelings and watch your mind and, and rest. It's important to rest, when you, particularly when you feel tired. But I don't, I don't recommend using either uh, trading tribe technology which I call TTP, trading tribe process, using that or anything else for uh, medicinal purposes, like a drug or alcohol or a sedative, you have to you watch out. There's a difference between using using any of these technologies as sedative, and I, I don't think any of the any of the uh, Zen masters really recommend uh, blissing out and staying there permanently. I think they want to be uh, want to be responsive and proactive to whatever feeling arises in the moment. I love the constant learning, you know, what's the better way to, to handle expressing oneself? What's the better way to, there's always a better way to do it, right? Well, I think so. I, I think I, I try, you know, we're, we're here in the moment and I'm learning something, uh, I'm learning something from you and I'm trying to be responsive and I'll, I'll think about this later and i'll say oh man uh and now i really could have said that better but that's this is how life is i do the best i can in the moment and then I'll go back and, and maybe uh maybe uh, do it differently next time and try to learn uh and try to learn and study my responses and say well can i can i change the response and then we, that's what we do in a, in a trading tribe we try to look at what our responses are to our feelings and then we practice identifying, well, what is it we are doing? How are we getting the result we're getting? And can we change our response patterns and get different results next time around? The only way you can learn is to extend yourself to perhaps in front of somebody that has more experience. And once you extend yourself, there's the chance that you might you might be forced to learn something that makes you feel like, wow, why did I just say it that way? I could have said it the way he just told me, but you want to get to the point of knowing the better way until you extend yourself with the wrong way. Yeah, we, we find in the right in, in the right environment, in the right environment, and we, we, we take a lot of care to set up the environment correctly. Once you set up an environment in which the goal is for people to help each other improve, I think this is true in the trading tribe, and some some companies have this down pretty well too. Some other organizations, where when growth, personal growth becomes important, then when people correct you or offer advice, you say thank you, thank you for helping me learn something. In a lot of situations, somebody will correct you or give you advice, and then then you get upset about it, and you may. You may say something to protect yourself or put them down or swear at them or tell them to keep their distance or whatever. So it's a different environment where, where, where you, everyone is trying to grow and do a better job. And that's another, another, another thing we had when you have a, an expansive economy and a, a company that's growing and everybody's trying to do better then the culture in that company, when you have growth, when you have a free competition society and free competition, you have a competitive startup firm and somebody says to somebody else, there's a better way to do this. Then they say, thank you for telling me. And they start doing it that way. When you get a survival 
a, a survival company, one that's overly uh, restrictive and political and, and there's, there's regulations. It's you better mind your own business and don't go talking to somebody else about what they should be doing. It's you see the whole environment, a whole structure. Uh, the environment in one case is pro personal growth and pro learning. And the other one is not. It's very territorial and very um, defensive. You can walk into companies. You can you can sense this right away. Some are open to grow and then they get mature. And then they if they start getting kind of the Gavopoli model and they start going the other way and they don't want to have, you don't, you offer advice at your own risk. You know, Ed, one of the things that you do in the Gavopoli book and your your premise is you, you talk about the strategy of trend following. And I don't want to phrase it as a solution, but you 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 offer trend following as a way to perhaps, I mean, the better, a better phrasing is, is to cope with as, as we move towards this Gavopoli system that you see as inevitable. And, and trend following is, is, and perhaps there's other solutions, and I'd love to hear if, if you think there are, but as you talk about trend following as one kind of a way to cope, I would love for you to go back in time a little bit, if you, if you will, and because you, you've had an interesting career, you've, you've, you've had some interesting mentors, interesting students, but I know when I, I mentioned this in my email, there's a couple, a couple traders in your early, early years that I think had a really strong influence on you. And I, I would love for you to share a little bit of wisdom or perhaps experience or thoughts or memories about two gentlemen in particular, if you wouldn't mind. And that'd be Amos Hostetter and Richard Donchian. And Amos Hostetter, which was, he was at Commodities Corporation and Richard Donchian at uh, Hayden Stone, just two very, uh, very accomplished early pioneers in the field of trend following. Now, would you share some wisdom? I'll be glad to uh, share what I know. Um, I I knew Donchin a, a lot better than Hostetter, and Donchin had a he had noticed this system. Uh, he noticed the two week rule in copper. Two week rule meaning you buy something when it makes highs for two weeks, and you sell it when it makes lows for two weeks. And he just noticed this somehow and he didn't remember exactly how he noticed it. I asked him once, how did you how'd you come up with a two week rule? And he said, I don't exactly know and you're the first person that's ever asked. He said he just kind of came up with it as far as I can remember. And that, that was the start of the that was the I think the first the start of uh, automated trend following was when he came up to the two week rule. And before that you can look at some of Livermore's writings and he had other a system of pivot points and so forth. And there's other um, there's other people that have talked about it. He basically started the two week rule. Now that won't work today. It's it, back back then you didn't have you have a little different character of the markets. And the two-week rule used to work in copper. And then and we found it, that, that you had to lengthen those. And maybe you make the, make the weeks longer, six weeks or sometimes. Now they've got 30 or 40, 50 weeks or much more than that. He, was, he had this system and then he had a couple followers there in his office. He, he came up with a system. He didn't always follow it himself, but he had this system and he had people on it and he had people that were religiously following the system and they seemed to do pretty well. And I came along and I uh, studied his rule set. He had Donchin's rules and Donchin's guidelines. And about that time, we had computers were starting to become uh, within reach of people to, to use them. Although they didn't have personal computers, they did have uh, mainframes that at some companies and I, I got if you can believe this I, I was I got to go into the major brokerage house at the time on the weekend and I had access to their mainframe computers that they used to run the company and I was in there and there was a security guard and there was me and I had access <laughs> to the complete computer base of the whole company and I was just using it to do computer testing were but, you pinch were you pinching uh, yourself at that time no, I thought it was just normal. I said, well, I want to do this research. And they said, okay. And nobody would, in those days, nobody ever thought about anybody trying to go in there and do anything nefarious. I was just in there doing research. No one even would even, in those days, you wouldn't even think about something like that. Uh, but these days, you couldn't get anywhere close to the uh, inner workings of a brokerage house. These days, you couldn't do it. But in those days, I did the, I did the computer testing on the mainframe 
computer of the brokerage house and all of their disks and all their history and everything. They were just sitting around in this big room. It was a huge room. And all these mainframe computers and the, the tape drives and so forth. Just, uh, now you get up, you can get probably all the com- computational power in that whole room. Probably you got more computational power in your cell phone now. In those days, that was quite the thing. So I would run, I would run test back tests, and I would take, I would do a back test that you could do now in probably a second or two. Uh, it would take half hour, forty five minutes to do one set of tests. And I was using punch cards, and it was a different. It was a different era back then. Did you find it? Did you find it unusual, or was it? What were your feelings at the time? Because it wasn't. There weren't a huge number of peers that you could bounce ideas off. I mean, you said you knew Dick Donchian, but it, there wasn't this. I mean, today there's 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 a there's a much wider network, and people are connected on the internet. They can reach out to you at FAQs, but there was no FAQs for you back then. No, and and I took Donchin's I took Donchin's um, work, and he had a letter that he would publish every every week. He would publish a, a letter, which would have his rules on it, and it would also have a kind of a model account, and you could follow along. And the idea was you would follow along, and you would place your orders with him. I guess that was the way that was supposed to work. So I tested his rules and I came back and said, well, the rules don't, they're uh, internally are not consistent. The rules don't, you can't program all all these rules at the same time because they conflict with each other. So I started finding, taking rule sets that that were uh, non-conflicting and I tried to tune it up and see, well, here's what we can do. And I would try different experiments with the rules and I would check it with some brokers and traders in the office. And and a lot of times I say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to change this. I'm going to make I'm going to make the uh, the system less responsive. So so the market has to go up more before you start to buy it. So make the time constants longer. And people would say, well, that's going to make it more risky because your stop's going to be further away. And then we would test it, and we would get the exact opposite results. So all these things were very counterintuitive. I did some of the first uh, testing, and 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 you're right, there wasn't any other standard now i've got i've got this on my website if you want to if you or your listeners want to go on the website and and replicate some of these tests to learn how to do it i've got it on there and there's a template and you can do it on your excel spreadsheet or whatever and then enough people have done it so they all get the same result to the penny so i'm pretty confident i've got the right answer up there but in those days no there wasn't any there wasn't any buddy else i was just curious and i said well how does this work and Donchin had had set it up as a system. I said, well, okay, I'm going to simulate it. I'll go back in the computer and see if I get the same results that Donchin is getting, and Donchin's getting, and I'll try to set up a um, a diversified portfolio. And and we did that. And we and the company I was with marketed it for a while, and we had uh, a diversified portfolio, and it was all run on computer uh, by a service bureau. I had a service bureau. And we would enter the data every day and and then get the result, and then we would put the orders in. But the company couldn't stick to it. The company I was with couldn't stick to it. And they also couldn't resist the temptation of trying to get the customers to trade more often than the system wanted them to trade. The, system, the problem with the system was it worked, and it made money for the clients but the problem was it made far less money for the brokerage house because they were used to day traders and they were used to people coming in and lasting a few months and then losing their money and moving on and doing something else and so that's the way the brokerage house set up people would come in and try to trade lose their money and leave and here was something else they would come in and they didn't believe they're going to stay and they, they said well commissions are like a, a tenth of what they used to be they're just they're staying with positions and this is going to wreck. This is going to wreck our business model. And so there was all kinds of pressures to get people to trade more often, and and then there was all kinds of pressures, like you pointed out in some of your your letters to me. There was uh, well, they've got fancy names for it now, like disposition effect. But in those days, people just didn't want to hold on to something. It was got one up a little bit, and they want to take their profit. Went down a little bit, and they want to add more and you know, hope it'll go back up. And and so you had uh, lots of pressures against 
uh, following systems in those days. So I had invented something that no one really wanted. Uh, and so then I, I left and I went out on my own, found, found clients, and I found that uh, some of the most important things was developing a relationship with the clients that they really knew what to expect and they knew what was going on. Because if, if, if the client was not aligned to it and if, if you didn't have emotional rapport, and understand that the, 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 the system is more than the mathematics. The system is the mathematics plus the willingness to follow the system. And when you, 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 you increase your worldview to include the investor himself and his emotional responses to what's going on, when you finally get the system include everything, you, gotta, you can design a system that works. But just, just going into a, a computer and, and tuning it up, your software and say, well, here's the right, here's the right set of parameters. Well, great. You've got something that theoretically will work for some theoretical robot that'll follow it. But there aren't a whole lot of robots that got money these days, maybe someday, but right now you've got human beings with human feelings. And unless you include that into your system design, the thing's going to, you know, the wheels are going to come off the cart around the corner. Yeah. That's, I mean, I think you really, sum up so much of your ethos in those last few sentences for those that are paying attention. I'm curious, Ed, too. I want just a couple more questions. I won't keep you. But as you talk about, we're talking today about your research into developing this Gavopoli model. You're talking about your early research with trend-following models. It seems like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you've been highly motivated by the puzzle aspect of just figuring things out. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I guess that's, I like puzzles. I've got, I've got a huge collection of, uh, what, what, uh, what, what you might call barroom puzzles or these metal, metal detanglement puzzles where you have metal pieces that fit together and you got to figure out how to get them apart and together. I've got a huge collection of those and I, and I, in the morning I do chess puzzles and I just like, I like figuring things out. It's always been something that I enjoy doing. I don't. I don't know exactly where that comes from. I think it's been. Um, I've been able to incorporate that in my life in such a way that it's useful. But yeah, I think that the, the puzzle aspect of what I did in the markets or what I did with the Gavapoli book, it's, it, what's driven me is I want to understand how it works. I want to know how it works. Then it works and it, it makes money. That's great. I mean, it's nice to make money, but I think I wouldn't have done it in the first place. Maybe figured out some other way of making money. But the puzzle, the puzzle is what got me. I said, I gotta figure <laughs> I gotta figure this out. Why does this, this guy Donchin has got this thing that's mechanical, it's making money? How, how can that be? How can you get something <laughs> that's mechanical that can make money for nothing without doing any work? How how can that be? And so uh I, I kind of got attracted to to looking at, it, but I, I don't think I would have gone into it. I wouldn't have gone into it for just the money. It was a, it was a, it was the puzzle. It was a, how does this work? I mean, how does this actually work? Can I build a model and can I understand this? And then uh, when you get when you understand it, then it becomes interesting to explain it to people for a while, or then you put it on the website, or you write a book, and you go on and you you look for a new puzzle. So I mean, when you when I'm you were when you were back in the day though, and you're in those mainframe rooms and you're by yourself and you're and you're and you're struggling. I mean, there's there's got to be a struggle, of course, to try and figure this all out. I mean, what was your was it just pure excitement at the time, and you're this this internal excitement that was driving you to just keep going and going till you got the puzzle solved? Well, that's a good question. That's one of the best questions I've ever heard. <laughs> what you know? What what motivates somebody who who's a researcher? What motivates them to uh, to go? Uh, I don't. You know, you say, well, is, is it the pleasure of the puzzle, or is it the discomfort and not knowing? Uh, I think it, it's deeper than that. It's just that's what I do. That's what I do. I do that, and I play banjo, and and I get lost in it. Mm. That's my meditation. I have to do it. If I mm. if I don't if I can't play music, something dies. And same with solving puzzles. That's just that's who I am, and that's what I do. And I don't I don't think I don't think of it as there's something that pushes me to do it. 
that's just who I am and that's what I have to do. Yeah. I some I mean I'm I'm I still feel like I'm uh uh in in training wheels, but I sometimes feel like my career is the same way. I don't necessarily know know why. I'm just I'm just driven to do what I do and I'm not necessarily sure what I even do, but I just do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. And you're good at it. And you you're you're that's one of the one of the the places I, I think we succeed in the tribe when we get people to this place you're at where you find out who you are and what you do and you just do it and you express yourself and you create a value by expressing exactly who you are, not pretending to be somebody else. That's a very high state. Congratulations for being there. It'd be a different world if everybody could get there. And I, you know, would hope people would follow in your footsteps and, and, I've, I've watched your career over many years, and I've seen you keep expanding and, and getting closer to who you are. And now you're, you know, you're really blooming, and you're really making a big contribution. So, you know, good job. Well, oh, I tell you though, you know, for those that don't know, you know, you, you <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell the exact story, but you influenced me greatly when I met you for the first time in 2001, and I, I can still remember some of the things that you said to me. And I think for for some people, they might have been they might have felt threatened. And I don't think I felt threatened. I, I I probably was like, okay, what has he just said to me? Why is he saying it? What's the deeper meaning? So in many ways, as you talk about your love of puzzles, I felt like you were giving me a puzzle. Michael, you might want to consider this. Ba 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 ba. And so then, of course, I just considered that. And and. You know, you didn't give specific instructions. You gave some big picture insights. And I think that's probably how you like to be. I think you just want to, you want to see if there's more puzzle finders out there. Yeah. And, 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 and like, you're, you're open. You wanted to do something. You wanted to, to, you wanted to go somewhere. You were like on a growth path. And then you viewed uh, ideas from me and other people. And you've you know, surrounded yourself with uh, an amazing group of people who have amazing amount of ability and, and knowledge and wisdom and, and resources. You've surrounded yourself with uh, one of the one of the most advanced group of mentors I think is possible. You just like to do that, so I think you had an attraction. You attracted people like that, and, and you enjoyed hearing what they have to say. The people that are on your podcast, people in your life, all are people with strong opinions, all are people that make you think and make mm. you grow. And you just have a, you just have some kind of a affinity for people like that, and that's part of what makes you good at what you do. Well, if they keep talking to me, I should keep talking to them. That seems like a good rule. If really smart people will agree to talk to me, I should probably talk to them because then I wouldn't be that smart. <laughs> well, I mean, it seems right. to be working. It seems to be working. Well, listen, hey, uh, you are. Uh, we I've kept you for too long. Hopefully, uh, you you will get on and and have some uh, some conversations more regularly. I think it. it I think you could appreciate. I, I'm sure you feel this that. The flow of our conversation, because we haven't really caught up on the phone for a long time, you can feel the flow improve as the conversation goes on, which is is fun. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's yeah, it takes a while to takes a while to get into it, and then it takes a while to get it to turn it off again. So <laughs> <laughs> it's time to time to turn it off now. So <laughs> hey, listen, Ed, I appreciate you taking the time. Everybody can make it to Seikota dot com s e y k o t a dot com. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, th thank you for making me think and uh, and for I enjoy uh, listening to you and talking to you. At all. You always make me think, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ed. You always make me think as well. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. 
I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.